God bless. We're now in our 11th session of We Are Different, Jesus' Radical Teachings, and we're going to focus on the subject matter of the Mosaic Law and what Jesus said about this in the Sermon on the Mount. I want to start by saying uh, this before we get deep into this, is that the Mosaic Law was a part of the Old Covenant. You have, you know, it says the Old Testament. Testament is another word for covenant. And uh, the, the first five books of the Bible are the Mosaic Law, what we refer to as the Mosaic Law. And uh, we're not under the Old Covenant. We're under the New Covenant that came with Jesus when he died on the cross. His blood, when he died on the cross, it ended the Old Covenant and it began the New Covenant. And by no means am I going to imply that we're under the Old Covenant when we study what we're going to look at in this session. However, this particular topic, this subject, has been a, a difficulty for many people for many years. Uh, some people have ruled out accepting the Sermon on the Mount as being a part of the Christian doctrine because of their misunderstanding of, that, of this thing that we're going to read tonight about the Mosaic Law. So uh, it, it's a little bit heady, and I, you know, I, I'm going to ask you to kind of follow along with me in the notes uh, because it, it is a very important subject to get right. It's, a, it's important to understand this. So we begin in Matthew 5, again in verse 17. Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Do not think, Jesus speaking, that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. The law would be those, again, referring to the first five books of the Bible. Those are the books that Moses wrote. And then the prophets are pretty much everything else in the Old Testament. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to what? Fulfill. There's a big difference between abolishing it and fulfilling it. He fulfilled it. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. So if you live like the scribes and the Pharisees lived, you're not going to get in the kingdom of heaven. It's an important topic that we're talking about here. Uh, to fully grasp Jesus' teaching about the Mosaic Law, and as much as uh, also the, the Sermon on the Mount, it's, it's crucial to recognize that he was addressing and correcting the prevalent religious teachings of his time, particularly those promoted by the Pharisees and the scribes. The religious leaders in the, day of, in the time of Jesus were teaching the wrong stuff about the Mosaic Law. And um, so a lot of what he's going to say in, in this section that we're looking at, and the remainder of the teaching, is, is rectifying the wrong interpretation that the religious leaders were giving in that time. If Jesus was here today, he would, be doing, he would do the same thing, I would assume. And there would be a lot, of, uh, a lot of direction, not so much towards the people that attend church, as it would be towards the ministers that are teaching the people, to the people that are standing in the pulpits that are teaching people the wrong doctrine about Jesus and about God. You know, uh, it, 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 so many uh, Christian beliefs today have steered very far away from what Jesus taught. So that's what we're, so we want to keep that in mind as we're going through this. He's trying to rectify wrong understanding that was being communicated. The way Jesus phrases this negative statement suggests that some were wrongly accusing him. In, in verse 17 again, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. He was probably being accused of abolishing the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. To f the law, the law, the basic, basically there's three parts to the Mosaic law that are, well, that are relevant to what we're looking at. The three parts are 
There's the sacrificial part of the Mosaic law. That is where they, they offered these animals. They offered tons of animals. They had all these grain sacrifices and all of these different sacrifices that they had that they were still doing when Jesus was here. When Jesus died on the cross, all of that came to an end because all of those sacrifices that were connected with the Mosaic law, it dealt with sin there in a temporary way, but it always was pointing towards Jesus dying on the cross as being the ultimate sacrifice, the complete sacrifice, and the end of sacrifices. The sacrifice that God accepts from us today has got nothing to do with dead animals. It's got nothing to do with grains. It's got everything our sacrifice, according to Romans chapter 12, is to live for him. You know, the, the, the sacrifice that he wants from us is not a dead one. He wants us to live for him, to give our lives as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. So that aspect of the law ended when Jesus died on the cross. The other aspect, this three, I said, the other aspect of the law was the moral code. The moral code was, you know, the Ten Commandments and the way that you were to conduct yourself, to live in love and to live a godly life. That moral code, uh, Jesus didn't end that. He didn't, he, did, he, he certainly, he, he kept to it. He always, he never sinned, so he kept the moral code. If anything, what Jesus did when he, with the Sermon on the Mount, is he heightened our understanding of what morality is. What is the right way to live life? He enhanced the commandments that were in the Old Testament about moral living. He gave greater depth and understanding, and in some situations, greater commitment, greater requirement. Then the third aspect of the Mosaic Law was the, governess, uh, the governing aspect of that law, that, that, uh, that so much is communicated how a people who live in a theocracy should conduct themselves. We live in a democracy, suppose, you know, or a republic, and there's other countries that live in a, what, a dictatorship, and there's different kinds of governing. The governing that is talked about in the Mosaic Law that the people of Israel are supposed to live under is a theocracy, a God government. God is the ruler and the, the sovereign of that. And the laws that were in the Mosaic Law were for a theocracy. Obviously, we don't live that way today. We don't live in a theocracy. We will when Christ comes back. So a lot of, when he said the law will be fulfilled, some of it was fulfilled when he was on the cross. Some of it is being fulfilled every day of our lives as we live morally. And, uh, but the, the most, you know, that, that theocracy is going to happen when Christ comes back. I, as, a, as, a, as a nation, the closer, as a, any nation or any, any kind of um, bureaucracy or government, the closer it is to what was said in the Old Testament, the better that country is going to be. One of, the, one of the great things about our country is that we, in, in forming the Constitution of the United States and, and setting so much the Bill of Rights and all the rest, the people that wrote this stuff were very much influenced by the Bible. And a lot of what was written in there was basically taken from the Old Covenant. So, again, uh, when Jesus said that every aspect of this is going to be fulfilled, he meant that. He most definitely meant it. Some of it has, some of it will be. Look at um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth passes away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So everything is going to be accomplished. The, the King James Bible says, uh, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. A jot represents the minutest Hebrew letter, and a tittle is the, is the, you know, the mark that would be put over a letter. What do we call that, Mercedes, do you know? The little accent mark they put over it? An accent mark, yeah. He, so he's saying every single aspect of the law will be fulfilled. Verily, verily, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, heaven and earth pass away, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Well, it's going to take until he comes back with the kingdom of God for all of it to be fulfilled. 
Jesus fulfilled the ethical precepts by obeying them, for he was born under the law and was determined to satisfy all righteousness. He did more than obey them himself. He explained what obedience would involve for his disciples. He rejected the superficial interpretation of the law given by the scribes. I hope you find this in your notes. Rather, he supplied the true interpretation. His purpose was not to change the law, still less to annul it, but to reveal the full depth of meaning that was intended to be whole, to, you know, that, that a person was supposed to understand by it. So then he fulfilled it by declaring the radical demands of the righteous God. This is what is stressed in the rest of, the, of Matthew chapter 5 by giving examples. The Pharisees were content with an external and formal obedience, a rigid conformity to the letter of the law. Jesus taught us that God's demands are far more radical than this. The righteousness which is pleasing to Yahweh is an inward righteousness of mind and motive. Yahweh looks at the heart, as is, we looked at it when we studied the heart. They, they, the religious leaders were concerned about how they looked, how they presented them, the outward stuff. You know, they had to have the flowers on the altar in just the right place. The chairs had to be in just the, set, the right order. Everything had to be, the podium had to be, and everything had to be persnickety, persnickety? <laughs> That's a new word. It's, a, it's in the, uh, the Finnegan Concordance, you'll find it. They were very persnickety about every little detail of what they thought was important. What Jesus was concerned about was the heart and living according to the heart. Look at uh, these verses up here in Jeremiah. This is, again, a very important part of understanding this. In Jeremiah 31, 33, there's prophecy, God bless, there's prophecy about what would happen after Christ descended into heaven. He waited 10 days and then he sent forth the Holy Spirit. This is prophecy about that time and about when Israel in the end will come to receive the same. Jeremiah 31, 33 says, By this, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them and on their heart. I will put my law in them and on their heart, their innermost being. I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. How's he going to do that? How did he do that? Ezekiel 36, 27 tells us, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. The spirit of God that was given to us, turn to Romans chapter 8. The spirit of God that is given to us enables us to fulfill the law in our lives. It enables us, it put the law in our hearts and it enables us to walk by those statutes and to live in observance of his, his ordinances. Romans 8 sort of explains this. Now you got to put your thinking cap on here. Therefore, 8.1, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. So the law of the spirit of life, and the chapter goes on to explain that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law that governed us, sin and death. That's what governed our lives before. You could say... Because they use the word law a couple of times, it gets a little confusing. It, you know, that the rules of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the rules of sin and death. Sin and death ruled my life before. Now, the spirit of Christ rules my life. For what the law, now you see that word law is in capital letters? Verse 3, for what the law could not do, 
Is yours in capital letters? It's, it's, yours isn't, Donna? Well, it should be. <laughs> it's referring to the Mosaic Law. For what the law, the Mosaic Law, could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4, so that the, right, so that the requirements of the law the requirements of the Mosaic law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When we walk according to the Spirit, we are fulfilling the requirements of the Mosaic law. That the moral aspect of the Mosaic law, we are fulfilling in our lives. As we walk by these Beatitudes, as we live the way Jesus teaches us to live, and there's, there's so much more, as we're going to see in following sessions, of how to live this godly life. When we, and you can do that because you're, you're enabled by the Spirit. The Spirit gives you the ability to do that. Otherwise, you couldn't do it. That's why under the Mosaic Law, they were not successful. They didn't have the Spirit. They couldn't keep the ordinances and the commandments. We do have the Spirit, and we have, we have His ordinance and commandments are written in our heart now via the Spirit, and the Spirit enables us to live accordingly. So we fulfill the law as we walk by the Spirit. Romans 13 simplifies this concept. If you would turn to that, Romans 13, verse 8. Romans 13, 8. Owe nothing to anyone. Rip up your credit card. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. As we live, that really was what the whole Mosaic law was trying to get across, to love God and to love others. You've heard Jesus say, what are the two great commandments? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 9 says, for this you shall not commit adultery. Let me start over in verse 8. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery. I mean, if you love somebody, if, you, if you're living lovingly, you're not going to commit adultery. You're not going to cheat on your spouse. You shall not murder. I mean, if you're walking in love, you're not going to be murdering people. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. If there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. See what Jesus was saying? Not one jot or tittle is not going to be fulfilled. When we walk in love, we're not going to steal, we're not going to cheat, we're not going to commit murder, we're not going to commit adultery, we're not going to beat people up. I mean, all these things that I used to do for fun, I no longer do. Because <laughs> they, they really weren't much fun, you know. They, so they're all sinful. So... Again, it's as we walk by the Spirit and we live lovingly, we're fulfilling the law. In your notes, I have Hebrews chapter 7, verse 22, and Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. They, these, I'm not going to go over these. You can look at them later. I, I highly suggest that. They talk about the new covenant as being a better covenant. The old covenant was the covenant that came by way of Moses. The new covenant came by way of Jesus. A lot of it is in the Sermon on the Mount and in the Gospels, and, and really great clarity is given in the Pauline epistles in the book of Hebrews, that we are, we are under a new covenant, which is a better covenant with better promises. And that's what these verses in Hebrews will reveal, reveal to you. And then write this in your notes if you have a pen, 2 Corinthians 3.6. 2 Corinthians 3.6 talks about the old covenant and the new covenant, and it, it calls the new covenant the new covenant of the Spirit. The new covenant of the Spirit. This new covenant that we live under is the new covenant of the Spirit. They lived under the old covenant of the law. And the new covenant of the Spirit fulfills the old covenant of the law. Now, in, in Matthew chapter, go back to Matthew, please. Matthew chapter 5. And in verse 19, it says, Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments 
and teaches others to do the same shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. In light of what we just looked at, you know, it's in the keeping of, you know, Jesus, Jesus knew what he was going to do in his sacrifice, and he knew what was in the future to a degree that God revealed it to him, knowing that the Spirit would come enabling people to live by the teachings that he sets forth in the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think anybody could live that way as, we'll, as we look at these next sessions. Nobody can, how can you love your, your neighbor? Uh, how can you love your enemy? How can you pray for those that despitefully use you? There's no human ability that, that people have innately within them to do such a thing. The spirit within us gives us the ability to live this new, wonderful, different life. So, um, the commandments in the law are to be obeyed within the context of Jesus' teaching. The moral principles, not the sacrificial or the governmental laws, are to be obeyed. Greatness in the kingdom belongs to those who are faithful in doing and, doing and teaching the whole moral law. Again, as redefined by Jesus. In verse 20 it says, For I say to you, unless your righteousness the right way of living surpasses the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Strong statement. For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses them, you're not going to enter into the kingdom. They were hypocrites. They were, they were not what God wanted people to be. The rest of Matthew chapter 5 contains examples of this greater and deeper righteousness that Jesus commends, comments. I think I skipped something. What did I skip, Donna? Yeah, all right. Matthew 23. Please read that and get back to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give you uh, detailed notes. That the rare part of your notes are, are explaining Matthew 23. The, the rest of Matthew 5 contains examples of this greater or deeper righteousness. Jesus' comments are not to refute the law, rather, oh, here it is, rather the wrong interpretation of it that the religious leaders taught. Are you with me in the notes? They made the law's demands less demanding. They made the law's demands less demandings and the law's permissions more permissive. So they made, you know, they just messed it up. When G what Jesus did was to reverse both tendencies. He insisted instead that the full implications of God's commandment must be accepted without imposing any artificial limits. However, the limits which God had set to his permissions must also be accepted and not arbitrarily increased. And we will see this as we move forward. In Matthew 5, what is set forth is, in the first thing there, it says, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not commit murder. But whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now Jesus, he just, you, it, it just said in the Old Testament, don't commit murder. It explains it a little bit. Jesus brings it to a whole nother level. He brings it to a whole much greater level. Verse two, or number two, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And then he, he explains that in much more detail. Third, you have, he said, it was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Again, he elaborates on this in verse 31. The fourth thing, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Again, as a, the reason I'm going through this is this is what follows in this chapter. The reason I'm going through it is because 
of the wrong teaching that was being put before the people. He's, he's clarifying it and bringing a deeper, clearer understanding of what God intended in the Old Testament. And he, at the same time, is refuting the wrong doctrine that is present and being circulated in his time. And it, that's why he, he says it over and over again. You have heard, he says that particularly in the King James, you have heard that it was said. He doesn't say you have, you have read what was written. He, he's, not, he's not arguing what was written in the Old Testament. He said, you have heard what was said by the, those that are old. And the fourth one is, again, you have heard that the ancients were told you shall not make false vows. He changes that whole thing. But you shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Five, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You have heard, now he changes that radically too. He changes all of this. It's, all, it's the radical teachings of Jesus that are far more demanding than the Mosaic law was. The sixth one is, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I need to qualify what I just said. They're far more radical. They, I'm talking about the moral code of the law. I mean, I thought the, the sacrificial end of it, that was pretty radical. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. That's, but that's not what we're talking about in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. We're talking about living righteously, the way we behave ourselves. Each of the above is followed with, but I say to you, he's going to bring it to a deeper depth of understanding. Now, in your notes, uh, following the questions, is this thing I've titled, the make-believer, the false deceiver. Oh, is he clever or what? The make-believer, the false deceiver. <laughs> Talking about the religious leaders in their time. The Gospels not only vividly depict the life of our Lord, but also contrast it with the behavior of the religious hypocrites, adding depth and clarity. It's just kind of cool when you're reading the Gospels. You see Jesus doing it the right way, and you see these religious idiots doing it the wrong way. So you get a clear understanding of how to live. Viewing the truth alongside the falsehood could brightly illuminate the genuine. The light of the truth always helps to expose the counterfeit. The reason to study this chapter is this essential verse regarding humility. In Matthew 23, verse 12, Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. These, these religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they were self-exalted, and uh, they needed to be humbled. And Jesus really puts forth uh, great clarity about what they were doing wrong and why it was wrong. And I'm going to leave that for you to study yourself this week um, because there's a lot in here. And um, then in our next session, we'll move into these different areas where it's very specific on how we are to live as we walk by these Beatitudes and our light and salt to the earth, how we're to, how we're to live in the day-by-day -day things that we are confronted with. So we'll get to that in our next session. God bless. Music